When I discovered that I was the malicious original spouse in a book, the female lead and I had already been married for two years. According to the book's description, in another six months, I would have to step down and make way for her. And this six months would be the period where I continuously make mistakes while also advancing the romantic relationship between the male and female leads. In the morning, as usual, I prepared my dear wife's favorite sandwich and hand-ground coffee. Then, I handed her the bag and keys and saw her off at the door. Standing at the doorway, watching the tail of the car disappear into the distance, a sudden flash of insight hit me, and everything I had forgotten came rushing back. At that moment, it felt like a sudden enlightenment, as if I had entered a state of epiphany. Here's the story. 25 years ago, I was reincarnated into the world of this book with memories of my past life. At first, I didn't know that I was in a book. It wasn't until a man, with a broad smile, said, Baby, we finally have names. We are called Bill Wan, David gently said. Willow, what do you think? David Wan is the man in front of me, my dad. As for Willow, without a doubt, it must be my mom. Bill. How should I put it? A bit cheesy. Although the name Bill sounded familiar to me, I didn't think too much about it. After all, such a common name has a high chance of being repeated. Three years later, Uncle Liu next door had a baby girl. That girl was adorable, like a little doll. So, my dad spoke up. Look at Susan, how well she matches our Bill. Old Liu. How about arranging a marriage for our children? I didn't hear Uncle Liu's response. My mind was stuck on the name Susan. Susan. Liu. Susan. Susan. Susan Liu. In an instant, I finally knew where the familiarity of the name Bill came from. Isn't this a character from the book I read before being reincarnated? It was a strong female lead romantic novel. As a standard in such novels, one part is the strong female lead and the other is the sweet romance. In that book, the strong woman was Susan Liu, an unapproachable and stern CEO. As for the sweet romance, it was Mike, a cheerful and promising intern. A newcomer to the workplace, he encountered countless setbacks and challenges, but despite everything, he remained full of enthusiasm and hope for life. His persistence and resilience made the CEO see him in a different light. Not only did she not blame him for his mistakes, but she also helped him a lot. Gradually, the boss's initial curiosity about the intern turned into deep affection. Thus began a romantic love story between the two. And for a beautiful love story to be enduring, there must be some clueless elements to add some spice. Dill was this clueless element. Dill and Susan grew up together as childhood friends. They were engaged as children and got married as soon as they reached the legal age. Dill loved Susan very much, but for Susan, her feelings towards Bill were more familial than romantic. Or rather, before Mike, Susan didn't know what love was. Her career and love life seemed to be prearranged, and she just followed along. But Mike's appearance was like a ray of sunshine, breaking the stillness of a stagnant pond and igniting a passion in Susan that she had never experienced before. However, they were innocent, even though their relationship was filled with romantic tension, they never crossed any moral boundaries. To advance the plot, this is where Bill steps in. As a husband, he quickly noticed his wife's unusual behavior and, through careful investigation, found Mike. Then came all kinds of suppression and bullying of Mike. His actions not only failed to harm Mike but also made Susan realize her feelings for Mike. At this point, I just want to say, well done. Thus, with each of Bill's antics, Susan grew to dislike him more and more, even asking for a divorce. Dill refused to agree and instead had Mike kidnapped, intending to ruin him. This crossed Susan's bottom line, and she used her powerful methods to bring down the Wong family and use Bill's own tactics against him, ultimately destroying him. Dill died silently and without notice. Susan and Mike lived happily ever after, eventually having a pair of twins. Happy ending. Damn it. When I realized I was in a book, I had only one belief. Cherish life and stay away from Susan. And that's what I did. Well, until she turned three. Before Susan turned three, I made sure to show my respect by staying away from her, seeing her, avoid, approaching her, cry, determined to become the most familiar stranger to Susan. But fate had other plans. It was working, even our parents thought we were incompatible. But fate insisted on opposing me. 
When Susan was three and I was six, I fell and hit my head. After that, I forgot everything about being in a book. My eyes and heart were filled only with Susan's adorable face. For the next 22 years, I became Susan's biggest fan, protecting and spoiling her, never letting her get hurt. And she accepted it all, never refusing. This only fueled my arrogance, and without a doubt, we walked into the marriage hall. No, the grave. Standing outside the villa, I pinched my thigh hard, tears streaming down my face. Damn it, seduced by beauty. Walking into the villa, the elegant sandwiches and steaming hand-ground coffee were still on the table in the living room. Untouched. Thinking back, starting for days ago, Susan suddenly stopped eating the breakfast I made. Her excuse was, too early, not hungry. I didn't think much of it and continued making her breakfast every morning. I always thought, maybe she'd be hungry today. What if she's hungry and has nothing to eat? But now, with my memories restored, I finally understood the reason. It wasn't that she wasn't hungry, she was saving her appetite to eat the breakfast Mike brought her at the company. Mike said coffee in the morning was bad, and sandwiches lacked the warmth of home. Mike said, I love so milk and deep fried dough sticks, and I also make my own millet porridge. Susan, try some. SSSS. Who? I took a deep breath, feeling a sharp pain in my heart. What should I do? Sitting at the dining table, Eating the sandwich I made, I felt like I was chewing on Max. Damn it, the heavens are unjust. If I had always remembered being in a boat, I wouldn't have gone near Susan, knowing that she would fall for someone else in the future, yet still getting involved with her, wouldn't that be self-torture? If I had just transmigrated into the book now, I would have immediately filed for divorce, cutting ties with Susan and all the messy affairs. But, 22 years, I have loved Susan for 22 years, and my love for her is real. Susan is special to me. I always believed that Susan loved me, even if it wasn't as deep as my love for her. I was still unique to her. That's why I could chase after her for so many years. Now you tell me, she doesn't love me, and has another true love. What do you want to do, kill me? At this moment, the housemaid opened the door and came in. Seeing me, she asked, Sir? What would you like for lunch today? I'll go buy groceries. Suddenly thinking of something, I stood up abruptly. Butler Sophia, make some dishes that Madam likes. I'll go to her company at noon. Okay. Start preparing. I'm going out for a while. All right. I drove away from the villa and went straight to the hospital. Susan's period was a week late this month. I hadn't paid much attention to it since her periods were always irregular. But with my memories returning, I remembered something. In the original story, Susan had a child, but Bill didn't know. One time, Bill went to the company to find Susan and saw her helping Mike with his tie as soon as he opened the door. In fact, there was nothing between them. It was just Mike's first time wearing a suit, and he didn't know how to tie it. Susan, who often helped me with my tie, assisted him out of habit, but Bill didn't know. He went crazy, rushing forward to hit Mike. Susan protected my can was pushed away by Bill. This push caused Susan to lose her child. Bill was devastated, feeling he had hurt Susan, and almost committed suicide. But he didn't know that Susan didn't want the child in the first place. I drove steadily to the hospital. Susan and I had been married for two years, but always used protection. We tacitly agreed not to rush into having children. I didn't know what Susan thought. For me, I just wanted a few more years of life together as a couple. Soon, I arrived at the hospital. Feeling numb, I went straight to the gynecology department. Unsurprisingly, I saw Susan. I watched her waiting for her number, seeing the doctor, paying fees, undergoing examinations, and waiting for the results. The whole process took two hours, during which my mind was blank. I couldn't think of anything. I watched Susan come out of the clinic. She held the lab results. She was silent for a long time, then tore the paper into pieces and threw them into the trash can. She left. The cigarette between my fingers fell to the ground. I didn't snap out of my daze until I reached the hospital entrance. Watching the people coming and going outside, I took a deep breath and drove back. 22 years of love, 2 years of marriage, and a child in the womb. I don't want my life to be doomed by the plot of a book. Susan, please, don't let me down. Back home, Butler Sophia had already prepared the meal. 
She was packing it into containers and said with a smile, It's rare to see such loving couples like you and madam these days. It makes me envious. Normally, I would have smiled happily, but at this moment, I couldn't even muster the strength to smile. The villa was a half-hour drive from Susan's company. When I arrived at her company, it was exactly noon. The receptionist recognized me. Without notifying anyone, I went straight to the private elevator and reached the 32nd floor without any hindrance. The first person to see me was Alex, Susan's assistant. His face stiffened for a moment upon seeing me, a flash of panic in his eyes, but he quickly recovered. Sir, why are you here? I smiled lightly. Where's Susan? Alex said, the president is in her office, I'll notify her. I pulled him back, no need, I'll go myself. I haven't been to Susan's company often, but I know the way. Walking to the president's office, I gently pushed the door open. The office had excellent lighting. At noon, the bright sunlight shone through the clean, clear windows, filling the room with light and warmth. Against the light, I saw a man and a woman sitting at the desk, with cute cat lunchboxes in front of them, sitting close together, eating the food in the lunchboxes with great relish. The beau seemed to be saying something, smiling. The woman looked up, listening attentively. Perhaps it was the sunlight, but at this moment, the woman seemed extraordinarily gentle, a gentleness had never seen before. Afraid I might be mistaken, I took out my phone and snapped a photo of this scene. Click. I clicked my tongue lightly. Damn. I forgot to turn off the sound, disturbing the scene. Damn it. Both of them seemed surprised by my appearance, their expressions stunned for a few seconds. Seeing such an expression on Susan's face amused me. I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Susan frowned at me, her expression clearly showing displeasure at my arrival. Oh, Susan. That really hurts. Mike's face turned pale, and he suddenly stood up. His movements were too fast, causing the soup container next to him to spill completely. Ow. The soup splashed onto his leg, burning him and making him scream. Susan quickly stood up, pulling him back. I turned and left. Unwilling to see what happened next. After all, we're all dignified people. I don't want to do anything undignified like in the original story. Alex stood behind me. Looking nervous, I shoved the lunchbox into his arms. Here. You can have it. Alex looked bewildered. I didn't leave but went to the secretary's office, seeing me enter. Several secretaries stood up. It seemed they all knew me. That's good. Saves me from explaining. Who is Joel? I asked. A meticulously groomed man stepped forward, trembling with fear. Sir, it's me. What can I do for you? I took out my business card from my bag and handed it to him. I'm very interested in what you have. Remember to contact me. Joel looked stunned. By the time I left the secretary's office, Susan was already standing outside. I masked my emotions and brushed past her with a blank expression. But she wasn't ready to let me go. She grabbed my hand. She asked, Why are you here? I said, Let go. Maybe my tone was too cold. As I had never spoken to her like this before, Susan tightened her grip on my hand. Bill, don't make a scene. I sign. Susan, let go. I don't want to talk to you right now. Susan's face turned ugly, her eyes burning with anger. I met her gaze without backing down. I, Bill, have never been a patient person. The only reason I was gentle with her was because I loved her. Now I realize, it's no longer necessary. I pried her hand off and left the company without looking back. After leaving the company, I didn't go home but checked into a hotel. Joel didn't disappoint me. He contacted me just an hour and a half later. In the original story, Joel was a minor character. He had great confidence in his looks, which made him somewhat arrogant. So when Mike caught Susan's eye, Joel was incredibly jealous. Joel was the first to notice the ambiguous relationship between Mike and Susan. Driven by various complex emotions, he took photos of all their intimate moments. These photos eventually ended up in Bill's hands and became the trigger for his downfall. I'm not interested in the downfall, but I'm very interested in the dirt. I bought all the scandalous materials Joel had with a sum of money. I have to admit, he was very thorough. He provided not only photos, but also videos. I stared at these materials for nearly two hours until my eyes were sore and my stomach was growling. 
rubbing my temples. I realized that even though I had no appetite, I couldn't neglect myself. Just after hanging up the hotel phone, my mobile rang. It was Susan, 7.27 p.m., her usual time to get home after work. I didn't answer and hung up directly. She didn't call again. This was Susan. After hanging up on Susan, I called my lawyer, Martin. Mr. Bill, what can I do for you? Draft a divorce agreement for me. I need it by tomorrow. He seemed stunned and didn't reply for a while. I thought there was a problem with the call. Hello, Martin? He finally responded. What did you say? Whose divorce agreement? I chuckled. Did he think I was asking him to draft someone else's divorce agreement? Mine. Between Susan and me. This time Martin reacted quickly. All right. I understand. How do you want to divide the property? I said. What's mine remains mine. What's hers remains hers. I don't want any of the joint assets. Although Susan and I had our separate businesses, we also had a considerable amount of joint assets. Over the years, various investments and collections have accumulated. If we were to divide them, it wouldn't be a quick process. Martin asked. So, you want to leave with nothing? Leave with nothing? I didn't like the sound of that. Then make it so she takes nothing of the joint assets. They're all mine. Susan has enough generosity to accept this. All right. I'll draft it right away and send it to you. Martin was efficient. He finished it in half an hour and sent it to me directly. I was amazed. That speed. I hadn't even finished my meal. I decided. I'd give Martin a big bonus at the end of the year. After finishing my meal, I was ready to go downstairs to print out the divorce agreement and develop those photos. Just as I opened the door, a shadow appeared startling me looking closely it was susan her brows were tightly knitted and her face was dark i wasn't surprised by susan's arrival she's a person with a strong sense of propriety as long as i'm still her husband she wouldn't just let me go since i didn't answer her call she would definitely come to find me why didn't you come home she asked in a low tone i said perfect timing come in and sit for a while i have something to tell you saying that i was about to leave where are you going she asked to print some documents i'll go with you i pushed her away and looked at her sternly no need wait here i let out a long breath as i entered the elevator tightening my trembling hands and muttered to myself pathetic when i returned with the printed documents susan was sitting properly on the sofa she was always so meticulous like a robot without emotions but today, after seeing those photos, I knew that wasn't true. The divorce agreement was in my hand. I didn't take it out but asked her. A friend of mine said they saw you at the hospital today. Are you feeling unwell? I was still hoping. Hoping Susan would tell me she was pregnant. But she just glanced up briefly. Then looked down again. She said, they must have been mistaken. I didn't go to the hospital. The hope that was hanging by a thread finally shattered. All right. There were two copies of the divorce agreement. I signed my name on both and handed one to Susan. Susan took it, confused, when she saw the words on the document. Her expression changed dramatically. She looked up at me in disbelief. Divorce. You want to divorce me? I nodded. Yes. Susan stared at me intensely while I calmly met her gaze. After a while, she threw the document on the table. Wide. I took out the printed photos and tossed them in front of her. The top photo was of her and Mike standing on the rooftop. Looking out into the distance, the photo was perfectly timed, capturing them gazing into each other's eyes and smiling. Susan looked through the photos one by one. Her expression remained calm and composed. Her hands steady. I let out a bitter laugh, comparing her reaction to mine. The difference was stark. Did you spy on me? After looking through the photos, Susan's eyes flashed with annoyance and hidden anger. I laughed in frustration. So after seeing all this, your only thought is to blame me. Susan, you've really shown me your ability to deflect. But just to clarify, I didn't follow you. Someone else took these, and I paid for them. Any problems? Want to sue me for invading your privacy? If so, go ahead. Susan's brows furrowed tightly. That's not what I mean. Mike and I are just colleagues. 
There's nothing between us. If it's about him, there's no need. Hot. I scoffed. Of course. I know. There's no holding hands. No hugging. No kissing. No sex. But so what? Am I, Bill, such a fool that I need to wait until it gets worse and my face is slapped before I react? Sorry. My bottom line isn't that low. Susan's eyes were cold as she stepped closer to me. Bill, what are you playing at? I told you there's nothing between us. What more do you want? I frown and step back. Don't you understand? I said I want a divorce. I can't live with someone who might cheat on me at any moment. Susan's expression turned exasperated as she yelled. Bill, stop this nonsense. Pack your things and come home with me. I can pretend none of this happened. I lost my temper too. Pretend none of this happened. Why should I? You act self-righteous despite what you've done. Divorce. Divorce. I want a divorce. Right now. Shut up. Susan raised her voice. Bill. I don't want to hear that word again. You're not a child. You need to be responsible for what you say. Her words succeeded in making me furious. Responsible? How dare she say those two words to me? I rushed over and pulled out one of the photos. In the photo, Susan was eating the buns Mike had bought her. Holding a cup of so milk. The date on the photo was just two days ago. I get up an hour early every morning to grind coffee and make sandwiches for you. I never sleep in. I treat you well. And yet when someone tosses you a bone, you think it's the best thing in the world. Do you even know what's good for you? My chest heaved. Talking to me about responsibility. Susan, are you even qualified? This was probably the first time Susan had ever been scolded like this. She looked at me with eyes that could almost eat me alive. But I didn't care. I only felt completely satisfied. Susan looked at me deeply. Are you sure you want a divorce? I handed her the divorce agreement and a pen. Showing my resolve through my actions, Susan's expression changed several times before she finally signed the divorce agreement with such force that the pen almost tore the paper. She didn't even glance at the contents. I raised an eyebrow, feeling slightly cheated. If I had known, I would have taken her for a lot more. After all, who would mind having more money? Susan stood up, face dark and full of anger, and left. As she walked away, I reminded her, Bring your ID and household registration book. I'll meet you at the Civil Affairs Bureau tomorrow morning. She paused, then walked away without looking back. The next morning, I woke up at dawn. I glanced at the time. Six o'clock. This timing made me angry. Years of forming a biological clock. No need for anyone to wake me. No alarm. I just wake up naturally. This instinct reminded me once again that years of genuine affection were wasted. Susan, you really did it. Suppressing my frustration, I buried my head in the pillow, trying to go back to sleep. But no matter what, I couldn't. And knowing, and knowing, I tossed and turned in bed for over an hour before I reluctantly got up. After breakfast and getting my things ready, I went to the Civil Affairs Bureau. I waited for Susan at the Civil Affairs Bureau for two hours. My patience ran out. And she still hadn't arrived. Now I was in a terrible mood. Susan, you are something else. Driving straight to Susan's company. Alex looked like he was facing a great enemy when he saw me. He said, Sir, the president is in a meeting. Would you like to wait in the office? I must have looked terrible, not wanting to trouble him. I went straight to Susan's office. Just as I sat down, there was a knock on the door, and Mike walked in. He was indeed good-looking, with chiseled features and a clean, sunny demeanor. He had an air of being untouched by the world. Sir, here's your coffee. I raised an eyebrow. You're delivering coffee? Are you a secretary? Mike frowned. I'm just doing a favor for someone. Are you that free? Mr. Wan. Why are you being so aggressive? I'm just helping someone out. Helping someone out. Indeed. A programming department intern running errands in the secretary's office. Are you neglecting your duties? Or is he? Mr. Wan. Mike firmly placed the coffee down. I know you have issues with me. But. Wait. I interrupted. This is our second meeting. Why would I have issues with you? Why must I have issues with you? Mike looked stubborn. 
I know you mind my interactions with Susan, but we are just friends. As her husband, you shouldn't deprive her of the right to make friends. I nodded. A friend who brings her breakfast, makes her lunch, eats with her, freely enters her office, interferes with other departments' work, and roams around during working hours. Is this all part of the special privileges she gave you? Mike, we're both men. We both know what your actions mean. Isn't that right, Susan? Mike spun around. And upon seeing Susan, he immediately put on a look of extreme restraint, pretending to be strong. Susan. Susan's face was grim. Mike looked at her with earnest eyes. But she didn't even spare him a glance. Walking straight to my side, she grabbed my hand. What's going on? It was only then that I noticed the stinging pain in my hand. Looking down, I saw a patch of red where the coffee had splashed. Seeing Susan's seemingly concerned expression, I felt a bit disheartened. I pulled my hand away from her grasp. I don't need you to care. Susan's face darkened. What exactly is going on? Mike looked humiliated. It's all my fault. I accidentally spilled the coffee just now. Susan then turned to Mike. All right. You can leave now. Mike glanced at Susan, then stubbornly turned and left. Alex, go buy some burn ointment. Okay. Susan manager, I'll go right away. I scoffed. What's this? Playing out a scene from the cowherd and the weaver girl, making me look like the villain who's breaking up a pair of lovers. Susan glared at me. Bill, what do you really want? Making a scene in public. I looked at her expressionlessly. What? Seeing me bully your little lover. Feeling heartbroken? But what can I do? I still hold the title of your husband. And I have some right to discipline any mistresses who come up. If you really cared about your little lover, you shouldn't have stood me up. I waited for you at the Civil Affairs Bureau for two hours. Where were you? No show. No call. Is your time the only time that matters? Who the hell doesn't have millions at stake every minute? Susan's face grew darker. Civil Affairs Bureau? Why were you at the Civil Affairs Bureau? I looked at her in disbelief. Why at the Civil Affairs Bureau? For a tour. Of course. For the divorce. Did you think signing the divorce agreement yesterday was just for fun? Susan stared at me. Her breathing becoming more rapid. And suddenly she collapsed backward uncontrollably. My heart tightened. And I quickly caught her. Susan shook her head. Looking very uncomfortable. What's wrong with you? Ignoring my question, she pushed me away and dry heaved a couple of times. Is this morning sickness? I gritted my teeth and asked again, what's wrong with you? Susan looked up at me, her face pale, but her gaze was icy cold. You want a divorce, right? Fine, let's get divorced. I laughed. This was the answer I wanted, and even now, it's what I wanted, but I felt a deep sadness. Emotions surging from the depths of my heart. My eyes grew hot. And tears uncontrollably streamed down my face. Susan was stunned. You're crying. I took a deep breath. You so wrong. Susan's lips trembled. Bill. We need to talk. In these 25 years of my life with Susan, there was never a moment we were absent from each other's lives. But because of the three-year age gap, it always felt like I was waiting for her. When she was three. I was six when she started kindergarten. I went to elementary school when she was six. I was nine. Just when she started elementary school, my classroom moved from the west campus to the east campus when she was 10. I was 13. Just when she moved to the west campus for a year. I went to middle school when she started middle school. I went to high school when she started high school. I went to college. When she finally got into my college, I had already started interning in the real world. So, how should I put it? A three-year age gap really is a hurdle. But even so, I was with her throughout her four years of college. In college, I confessed to her. She accepted. And we were together. At that time, I rented an apartment outside of school. And Susan moved in with me. Back then, I was already very busy. And the rented place was far from my company. But even so, I would come back to our little home every day. Susan would be there waiting for me. No matter what. I always had to go back. I love her. 
I think she loves me too. Sitting in the quiet private room, Susan was carefully looking at the menu. My gaze wandered to the side. I'm willing to land on her. She asked me, what do you want to eat? Not wanting to mistreat myself, I ordered a few light dishes and then stopped. Susan gave me a strange look but didn't say anything. She added two more dishes and handed the menu back to the waiter, signaling him to leave. As soon as the waiter left, she suddenly got up and sat next to me, caught off guard. She grabbed my hand. I was startled and instinctively tried to pull away. But Susan stopped me. Don't move. What are you doing? Susan lowered her head and looked at my hand. Don't move. I'm applying medicine. Her voice was a bit hoarse making my heart ache slightly. She pulled out a tube of ointment from her pocket. I can do it myself. Saying this, I reached for the ointment in her hand. But Susan dodged and said, Let me do it. No. I'll do it myself. Bill. Susan was angry. My hand paused in midair and then dropped weakly. Forget it. We've already seen each other naked. What's the point of being pretentious now? I turned my head away. Not wanting to look. After a while, a cool sensation spread over my hand. Along with the softness of Susan's fingertips, my heart trembled slightly. Bill, do you really want a divorce? I didn't realize when Susan had returned to her seat across from me. Hearing her question, I nodded. Yes, just because of those photos. Yes, Susan took a deep breath. She was frustrated and trying to suppress her emotions. She said, Mike and I haven't done anything inappropriate. Not before. Not now. And not in the future. What are you really upset about? It's just a normal superior-subordinate relationship. You work too. Don't you understand? It was really hard for Susan to repeat such pointless words over and over again. Susan. I looked up at her. Why don't you sit next to me? Why do you always sit across from me? Susan frowned. Looking confused as if she didn't understand the meaning of my words. Or perhaps she had never considered the question. I said, from the age of three until now, 22 years. Let's count 300 days a year. That's 6,600 days. Rounded down to 6,000 days, assuming one meal a day. We've had at least 6,000 meals together. In these 6,000 meals, you've never sat next to me, always across from me, just like earlier. Even though you sat beside me to apply medicine, you still returned to the seat across from me. Look at the distance between us. At least a meter. But with him, you can sit side by side. What was the distance then? Five centimeters? Or zero? Susan froze for a moment, then stood up awkwardly. I raised my hand to stop her. Don't come over. It was just an accident. In the office, the only table where you can eat is that one. And it can't. I didn't let her finish and interrupted her directly. Do you remember when we were in college? We lived in Yi Cheng apartments. And every morning before going to work, I would get up to make you breakfast. At first, I didn't know how to cook. So I could only heat up milk and cook plain rice porridge. But you can't eat that every day. So I learned to cook. When I wasn't busy, I would try making various breakfasts at home months. Dumplings. So milk. Fried dough sticks wontons, noodles, later. I even started making egg-filled pancakes and jianbing wozi at home. Back then, breakfast was all I could make for you. You waited at home for me, and I wanted to make sure you ate well in the morning. But you didn't have an appetite in the morning. I could tell you were struggling to eat what I made. So, I simplified the breakfasts again. The only breakfast you can completely finish in the morning is a sandwich to triangular slices of toast a soft boiled egg with a bit of pepper, two slices of luncheon meat, and a piece of lettuce. The most important thing is that you don't want any sauce. You probably don't even realize this yourself, but I figured it out from making you breakfast day after day. As for the hand ground coffee, you don't like milk because it makes you bloated. You don't like so milk because you can't stand the texture, but coffee with milk, you can drink very comfortably. Don't I know that drinking coffee in the morning is bad for the stomach? but you like it. And have you ever had an upset stomach from drinking coffee in the morning? Susan, do you know what the soup you drink every night is? It's to nourish your stomach. I've nurtured your stomach day, I day so that you can drink your favorite coffee in the morning. And even if you skip a meal or two, you won't get a stomachache. 
It's not for you to eat junk food. Susan's expression was grim, her mouth open and closed. And finally, she looked at me intently and said, It won't happen again. Never again. I shook my head. There's no never again, Susan. The smile you show him is a smile you've never shown me. Not even when we took our wedding photos. During our wedding photo shoot, you had the same expression the whole time. Later, I overheard the staff gossiping. They said, This woman must have been forced into marriage. Look at her. Not a single smile from start to finish. She seems very unhappy. I wasn't unhappy. I was just, I was just nervous. There was something in Susan's eyes that I couldn't understand. Like, panic. I shook my head. Impossible. When has Susan ever panicked? I rubbed my temples, which were starting to ache. Susan walked up to me, knelt down on one knee, and held my hand. She looked at me seriously, more seriously than when she accepted my proposal. She said, I will transfer Mike to a branch office, and I won't see him again. Perhaps I didn't handle the boundaries between us properly, but I assure you, I only admire him admire his attitude towards life and work. Nothing more. You have feelings for him. Susan frowned. I don't. Her tone was decisive. Without a hint of hesitation, I shook my head. You have feelings for him. Susan's expression grew increasingly agitated. This is my own heart. I said no. And that's it. I pulled my hand away. Susan's face turned cold. Staring at me expressionlessly. Susan, I know you too well. Over the years, there have been countless men circling around you, trying to get close. But you never gave them a second glance. But this man is different. He made you break your rules too many times. He's the first in your 25 years of life. In other words, this is what they call true love. I'm a businessman. If an investment is about to bankrupt me, I will definitely cut my losses in time to minimize the damage. Susan, you have feelings for someone else. That's why I don't want you anymore. Susan refused my request for a divorce. This was to be expected. After all, Susan isn't someone who acts impulsively or emotionally, just like in the book. Even in the end, she wasn't divorced, only widowed. Thinking about this, I couldn't help but shiver. Susan wouldn't want to kill me, would she? I shook my head. It shouldn't be that extreme. I can understand many plot directions in the book, except for one thing. Susan bringing down the Wong family. That's not something Susan would do. If the Wong family were to fall, at most, Susan would lend a hand. The deeper reasons would definitely lie within the Wong family itself. It seems I need to thoroughly review the company. After our talk, Susan seemed lost. She only said, I won't divorce you. We will stay together. I felt I had made myself clear enough. And I was too tired to say more. After all, I'm not her emotional advisor. It's not my job to help her understand her own feelings. I stood up and walked away. She grabbed me. Where are you going? I said, home. She didn't let go. Which home? I said, city A. Upon hearing this, she seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. She said, wait for me at home. I'll take care of everything. I shrug, not really caring. City A is the place where we lived after getting married. She thought I was compromising and going home. But I didn't tell her I was only going back to pack my things. When I returned to Sidio with a team of professional organizers, the housekeeper, Sophia, was shocked. At first glance, it might have looked like the house was being seized. Sophia looked bewildered. Sir, what are you doing? I said, moving out. Without waiting for Sophia to ask more questions, I started giving instructions. Take down all the photos and paintings from the walls. Yes, sir. Pack up all the men's items in the second floor dressing room. Yes, sir. Move the entire bookshelf from the master bedroom on the second floor. Yes, sir. Clear and throw away all the carpets. Yes, sir. Uproot the ginkgo tree outside. Yes, sir. Everyone else. Clean the entire house and remove anything with masculine characteristics. Yes, sir. I came with a grand entourage and left the same way. Sophia tried several times to approach me, but my calm demeanor kept her at bay. 
She works for Susan and gets paid by Susan. Once I leave, we will have no further interaction, so there's no need for pleasantries. After leaving Sidia, I didn't go home but went to another property I owned. Mr. Wang and Mrs. Li were still traveling and hadn't returned. There was no need to worry them. Besides, I was determined to divorce and didn't want to hear any more advice. After leaving, I blocked all of Susan's contact information and went straight to the office. For the next week, I practically lived at the company, reviewing all contracts and accounts. Sure enough, I found a problem. The company's chief financial officer had secretly set up a shell company to commit tax evasion. It would have been fine if he had embezzled all the money himself, but he transferred a small portion to my father's account under the guise of dividend payments. Ha! Huh. Quite capable. Not only did he break the law, but he also tried to make my father the scapegoat. Who gave him the nerve? Oh, it was my father. This CF is a company veteran. My father's best buddy, who fought alongside him for many years and took care of me. It's shocking to discover that the wolf that bites your neck is actually right beside you. But it's understandable. After all, if Susan can change, why can't anyone else? Having identified the root of the problem, I handed the matter over to Martin. My lawyer, what should be done about this? As a law-abiding citizen, of course, we will handle it according to the law. During this busy week, many people sought me out, but three were the most notable. They were Susan, Mike, and Joel. I didn't see Susan. She tried to force her way in, but I called the police. I didn't see Mike either. Do I have time to chat with a mistress? As for Joel, I must say he is quite the character, a peculiar person with great potential to be a malicious pawn. For some reason, he took me as his superior and began sharing every detail about Mike and Susan with me. Mr. Bill. Today Susan wants to transfer Mike out of the main company. And he stormed into the office to argue with her. He said if she did that, he would resign. Susan just said, Make sure to complete your handover. Manager Wong. Mike has gone to the branch company. After all the fuss, he didn't leave. Well, with such good benefits at Shen Corp, who would want to leave? Mike brought breakfast for Susan again today. But she didn't take it. Mike said, Whether you want it or not is your business. But I must fulfill my promise. In the end, Susan still didn't eat it and threw it in the trash. I must say, Well done. His stuff belongs in the trash. But I feel there's something fishy here. A promise? What promise? I need to check it out. I found out. A month ago Mike had appendicitis. And Susan took him to the hospital. I took out my phone and looked at Joel's latest message. Mike went to the rooftop again to coincidentally meet Susan. That's Susan's private spot. None of us dare to go up there. But he treats it like his own backyard. I felt speechless. Aren't you afraid of getting your salary docked for being so idle? Joel was excited. Manager Wong, you finally replied to me. Don't worry. I have all of Susan's movements under control. Do you want photos? I'll send them to you. Me? Number. Thanks. Joel, I'm in the process of divorcing Susan. You don't need to send me anything about her and Mike anymore. Joel. Manager Wong, please. Losing to you is a matter of humility, but losing to Mike is too embarrassing. I laughed. Then you can choose to take his place. After all, Joel is also quite scheming. I wouldn't dare. That's Susan. I doubt she even remembers my name. What's wrong? Think you can't compare to Mike? Joel, how should I put it? We're mere mortals. While he's like a white lotus fairy. TSK. I don't know what Susan's taste is. The more I think about it, the more annoyed I get. Joel's words amused me. Are you free tonight? Let me treat you to dinner. Joel immediately reply. I'm free. I'll rearrange everything for you. Manager Wong. We arranged to meet at Alicia's Western restaurant. When she saw me, she was surprised. Did you come alone? Didn't Susan come with you? I was more surprised. When did she ever come with me? Alicia rubbed her nose and laughed sheepishly before leaving. Chatting with Joel was quite enjoyable. He was straightforward, direct, and even when he tried to be roundabout, it was easy to see through him, making it relaxing to be around him. But life is a play.
full of coincidences and surprises. For instance, Mike happened to work part-time at this Western restaurant. When he saw me, he instinctively wanted to hide. But the next second, he suddenly straightened up. Seeing him, Joel rolled his eyes. Oh, is he trying to pull off some inspirational act again? Mike looked aggrieved. You should ask Mr. Bill. I was bewildered. What did I do? I waved him over. Come here and tell me. What did I do to you? Mike's eyes were filled with anger and grievance. He said, Mr. Bill, if there's been a misunderstanding between me and Susan that has caused you distress, I can explain. But taking it out on my parents, isn't that too much? Mike, I'm giving you a chance to speak. So use your time wisely. Don't play word games with me. Holding me accountable? You're not qualified. Just as I finished speaking, Susan rushed in hastily. She was wearing a light gray suit, one that I had bought for her. A misstep I had thought of everything but forgot about the things I had bought for her. I should have taken those too. I laughed. Seems like I spoke too soon. Apparently, you are qualified. See? Your backer is here. Mike turned around, looking at Susan with delight. But Susan didn't even spare him a glance. Her gaze was fixed on me. Not leaving for a second, I looked at her she seemed haggard, thinner, with a touch of desolation in her eyes. I said, are you here to support your little lover? Why do such dishonorable things? Just divorce me. What's the thrill? Susan seemed not to hear my words. She took a few steps forward, staring at me intently. Why didn't you come home? Why didn't you see me? I put on a cold face. Not wanting to continue this pointless conversation. I turned to Mike. I know you've been trying to find me these past few days. I'll give you one last chance. Say what you need to say. Mike looked at Susan with hopeful eyes. But seeing that she wouldn't respond to him. He looked at me with humiliation. Mr. Bill. Why did you fire my parents? They worked diligently at Wang's for so many years. How could you dismiss them on a whim? What did they do wrong? Is it such a coincidence? Mike's parents work at my company. This really complicates things for the malicious original wife. Mike, you've watched too many romantic dramas. Do you know how many people work at my company? Thousands of employees. Who are your parents that I would personally fire them? Even if their dismissal was unrelated to me. What if it was at my behest? Do you think I run a big company and earn so much money to do charity? Number. It's for my own satisfaction. As the top decision maker of the company, don't I have the right to fire a few people with bad conduct? Susan, don't I? I coldly looked at Susan. Susan looked back at me and said, Come home with me. I've retrieved everything. Everything will be like it was before. Come home with me. Me? What? Mike was unhappy. On what grounds do you say my parents have bad conduct? Because they raised a son with bad conduct. Mike's face turned red. Mr. Bill, you're too much, just because you have money and power. You think you can bully people? What did I do? How can you say that about me? I was just grateful to Susan for taking me to the hospital. I bought her breakfast and made her lunch out of gratitude. What did I do wrong? I nodded understandingly. I get it. I understand. I glanced at Joel, who was watching the drama with excitement. I asked him, if you had appendicitis, would you call Susan? Joel shook his head vigorously. Do I not have a phone? Wouldn't I call 911? Don't I have parents? They'd be the first I'd call. Don't I have friends? Am I that pitiful? If worse comes to worst, I can crawl out and knock on the neighbor's door. Mike's face turned from green to white. And even if I did call Susan, at most she'd call 911 for me. My words cut deep. Each one a precise stab. But Mike's face showed a glimmer of hope. Susan didn't look at him. She said, It won't happen again. I felt disinterested. Mike, don't get discouraged. Once I'm done divorcing Susan, you can take your place. For now, be patient. Don't give me a chance to finish you off. Susan clenched her teeth and grabbed my hand. We're not getting divorced. Not now. Not ever. There's no one else. Only you. What's the point of saying these things now? I tried to pull my hand away but she wouldn't let go. I didn't mean to throw her off. Just one push. And she stumbled, hitting the edge of the table. 
Her face turned tail instantly, and she clutched her stomach protectively. She held my arm tightly. Da baby, da baby, Bill. Our baby. Did I want a baby? The answer is yes. Before I brought out the divorce papers, I always hoped Susan would tell me she was pregnant. I thought, as long as she said it, I would forgive her. It wouldn't matter if she liked Mike or if she had feelings for him. As long as she still wanted to keep our baby, we could start over. But she never said it. Even as we proceeded with the divorce, she never said it. I thought she had already terminated the pregnancy, but now she says she's carrying our baby. Susan lay on the hospital bed, holding my hand tightly. I didn't pull away. Honestly, I was exhausted, physically and emotionally drained. The doctor said, you have symptoms of a threatened miscarriage, but your physical condition is good. The problem isn't severe. Stay in the hospital for a few days. Get in for two protect the pregnancy, and afterward. Rest well, keep a good mood, and avoid any more impacts. I nodded. Thank you. After the doctor left, a nurse came to administer the four. The drip was slow. Neither of us spoke. After a long while, Susan said, I'm pregnant. And then? My voice was hoarse. Harsh to hear. Susan's hand trembled. Then she hurriedly let go. What did you say? I looked down at her. And then? Susan's eyes instantly reddened. I'm pregnant. Our baby. And you're asking me and then? Even if I'm pregnant. You still want to divorce me. I found it hard to breathe. Our child. Didn't you decide not to keep it? How could it be our child? Susan shook her head. No. I interrupted her. When did you find out you were pregnant? Why didn't you tell me? If you didn't want a divorce. If you thought being pregnant could affect our divorce. Why didn't you say anything? Susan's lips pressed into a thin line. Her hands tightly clenched on the bed. I let out a sarcastic laugh. Can't answer? Then let me answer for you. Because you never intended to keep it. Since that's the case. Why use it as a bargaining chip? A long silence. Susan spoke again. Her voice choked with emotion. Bill. Can we not get divorced? Please? I shook my head decisively. No. Susan's breathing grew heavier. I'll keep the baby. We won't get divorced. Susan. I shouted. Don't use the baby as a bargaining chip. Susan cried. I didn't handle my relationship with Mike well. It won't happen again. Let's start over. Please? I felt a bit of pain in my heart and sigh. Others can. But you can't. Because you're Susan. Susan looked bewildered. For so many years. The only man you've publicly acknowledged as a friend is Mike. Right? Even those we grew up with didn't have that honor. Yes. Now you're just friends. But what about in the future? Susan. Ask yourself. If I hadn't escalated this to the level of divorce, if I had just argued with you, or even threatened you, what would you have done? You'd find me annoying. Think I'm petty. Think I'm unreasonable. You'd repeatedly tell me, we're just friends. You know, the worst part is people like you, hiding behind the guise of just friends, doing ambiguous things, and then blaming me, even if something happened between you. You'd say it was my fault. Why not cut it off at the source? A piece of rotten flesh should just be cut off. Susan shook her head slowly. She looked at me pleadingly. Bill. You can't do this. You can't leave me over things that haven't happened. These are just your assumptions. They won't and can't happen. I rubbed my temples. Do you know about risk assessment? Susan stiffened. What about our relationship? Our 25 years together. Are you just going to throw it all away so easily? We're having a child. We'll get better. Bill. You still love me. You still love me. It seemed that this love was her last hope. The confidence I had given her. I interrupted her. Susan. Do you love me? Susan looked at me. And for the first time. She directly answered my question. Bill. I love you. I scoffed. You can do ambiguous things while loving me. So. If I want to divorce you while loving you. What's the problem? Susan's face turned pale. She looked at me pleadingly, her eyes like those of someone drowning in despair. I turned away, not wanting to look at her anymore. Susan, 
I'm giving you a week to think about it. What about our child? As you wish. If you want to keep the baby, I will support it. If you don't, I can accompany you for the surgery. My words were cold and heartless, hurting both her and myself. A dull thud sounded behind me, followed by Susan's beast-like roar. Bill. Susan stayed in the hospital for a week. She caused a commotion for a week. Refused to eat properly. Refused to cooperate with treatment. Unless I was there. The caregivers and doctors kept calling me with various excuses. I thought, thank goodness her parents didn't know. Or they would have come over. But I wasn't completely heartless in this matter. I visited when I should. I brought her meals when I should. But I didn't speak any unnecessary words. Slowly, Susan also fell silent. One day, she suddenly said, Bill, I'm really scared. When you act like this, I feel like you're drifting further and further away. I didn't know what to say. 22 years of feelings, I'm not a robot, facing her. I also felt sad. I also felt heartbroken. But each bout of sadness and heartbreak reminded me that it was all caused by her. She was the one who first disregarded our 22 years together. I repeatedly went over this process in my mind. A thousand arrows through the heart. Just like that. And then there's the child. What are you planning to do? Susan caressed her belly. What if I say I want to keep the baby? I'll pay child support. And I will take care of it. Susan looked at me with teary eyes. Bill. During pregnancy and breastfeeding. As long as I don't agree. You can't divorce me. Yes. That's correct. But the baby will eventually be born. And will eventually grow up. Susan. Let's stop forcing things. What if I insist on forcing it? This version of Susan made me sad. I gently brushed her bangs aside. Then we might not be able to part on good terms. Susan choked up. Bill. You are too cruel. You gave me confidence with 25 years. You made me mistakenly believe that everyone in this world might leave me. But not Bill. But now you're abandoning me without hesitation. Without leaving any room for reconciliation. Bill. You're too cruel. Her sobs made my heart clench painfully. But only for a moment. Then let's just consider it my mistake. Susan shook her head. No. It's all my fault. I was wrong. She looked at me with red eyes. Bill. If you could do it all over again, would you still be with me? The question made me pause. Looking back at those 22 years, I had accompanied her. And she had also been there for me. Yes. Susan stared at me in a daze. Susan, I'm 28 this year. You have been a part of my entire life. You have always been there for me, no matter what happened. You were the first person by my side. You didn't miss any stage of my life. You witnessed everything about me. Susan, falling in love with you was inevitable. I can't deny the past 22 years because of current mistakes. Likewise, I can't accept the current mistakes because of the past 22 years. What should we do? Susan, tell me. What should we do? Tear silently fell from my eyes. Susan stared at me. A painful cry escaping her lips. For the first time, she truly realized what she had done wrong. With a hoarse voice, she said, Bill, I agree to the divorce. Without any disputes over assets, my divorce from Susan proceeded smoothly. Looking at the freshly issued divorce certificate, I let out a long breath. I felt both a sense of loss and relief. Do I hate Susan? It doesn't seem to have reached that level, but as long as she holds the title of my wife, the thing she did will remain a thorn in my throat. Only by shedding this title can I truly let go. What is this called? Let's call it self-rescue for now. I took Susan back home. I stopped at the door. This is as far as I go. Susan looked very haggard. She asked, Bill. Will you come to see me in the future? I should. After all, there's still the child. Susan ultimately decided to keep the baby. I don't think it's a wise decision. But the child is in her belly. I can't take away her right. I turned and left. Leaving Susan standing there. Mr. Wong and Mrs. Lee had returned from their trip. Seeing me, Mrs. Lee was very happy. Son, have you lost weight? Lost weight? That's good. Mr. Wong came down from upstairs. Where's Susan? 
Why didn't she come back with you? We're divorced. I didn't intend to hide it from them. Mr. Wang and Mrs. Lee were both stunned. Standing there. Why'd I? I handed them the divorce certificate. This. Mr. Wang glared at me. What's going on with you? Such a big matter. Why didn't you discuss it with us? Do you even consider us your parents? Mrs. Lee gave him a hard slap. Why are you scolding our son? Given how he was with Susan, if it wasn't absolutely necessary, she didn't finish her sentence. I lowered my eyes, letting out a sarcastic laugh. See? Everyone knows how deeply I love Susan. Mrs. Lee suddenly stepped forward, stood on tiptoe to hug me, gently stroking my hair. It's okay, as long as you're back. Smelling the familiar fruity scent on Mrs. Lee, my nose felt a twinge, and tears uncontrollably streamed down my face, full of grievances, full of anger, full of desolation. I thought, let me be a child one more time. Let me cry one more time. For the last time. Come tomorrow. I will once again be the elegant, omnipotent young Mr. Wan. Epilogue 1. Susan. From as far back as she could remember, Susan had a big brother who could do anything. This big brother was named Bill. And he was particularly handsome. He said, Susan is the prettiest in the world. Susan is obedient and cute. And I like Susan the most. But Susan knew that she was actually very domineering and held grudges. When she was eight, Bill fell in love with Lego. He could sit quietly and build all day. Susan didn't like it. Well, it wasn't that she didn't like it. But she was only five at the time and didn't know how to build. But Bill didn't mind. He would build Lego and give Susan a storybook to read while she lay beside him. Often, Susan would fall asleep while reading. At those times, Bill would stop what he was doing and cover her with a blanket. One day, a girl came to visit with her mother. Seeing the Lego, the girl wanted to play too. Susan wasn't happy. But Bill agreed and decided to play with the girl. Susan got angry and walked away. Bill chased after her. Susan, what's wrong? Susan pouted. Clearly unhappy, she said. I don't want you playing with others. Bill agreed without hesitation. Okay. I won't play with others. Only with Susan. But you can't play with others either. Okay. Susan remembered nodding. She even made a pinky promise with Bill. They promised each other from a young age. Bill kept his promise. Susan forgot hers. How could she forget? How could she? A friend said. You're just used to Bill's presence. You'll get over it. After all, you don't love him. Susan thought this was the most ridiculous thing in the world. She threw her cup to the ground and growled. I love him. She loved Bill. She only loved Bill. But why? Why did even her best friend think she didn't love Bill? Bill had always been the center of attention. No matter where he was, he always attracted everyone's gaze. She didn't like the way people looked at Bill. So, like declaring her ownership, she would throw her school bag to Bill. But even so, she couldn't always be by Bill's side. At that time, Susan was a high school freshman, and Bill was already in college. Although they were in the same city, the distance between them grew. One day, she saw a photo in a group chat, a path covered with flowers, dotted with candlelight, a shy girl blocking Bill's way. That was the first time Susan felt panicked. She rushed out of the classroom and ran back. That was the first time she skipped class. But standing outside Bill's school, she didn't know what to do. Her mother once sighed. You have to speak up. Even to those closest to you. If you don't speak up, no one knows what you're thinking. Bill saw her when he returned to his dorm. He happily hugged her. The warmth made Susan blush and her heart race. She hurriedly pushed him away. She scolded him in embarrassment. What are you doing? Bill didn't mind at all. He looked at Susan with a grin. He straightforwardly asked, Did you come back because you saw the photo? Are you jealous? Without waiting for Susan to answer, Bill continued, Don't worry. I won't be with anyone else. I've already rejected her. After all, I'm going to be Susan's boyfriend. Hearing this, Susan's heart settled. Bill was always like this, giving her all the security she needed. Susan couldn't help but call Bill and tell him about this. She wanted to tell Bill that she loved him. And had loved him since then. Bill was silent. After a while. He said. 
Do you remember how you answered me? How could Susan forget? After hearing Bill's words, she had said, What photo? I don't know. I came with a classmate to buy something. Just happened to pass by. Susan's grip on the phone tightened. No. I, I was just embarrassed to tell you. Dill interrupted her. Susan, do you really think it was an accident that you saw that photo without my consent? Who would send such a photo to a group you're in? At that time, I went to university and you were getting further away from me. I was scared. I was scared you'd fall for someone else. That you wouldn't wait for me. I desperately wanted to prove that you loved me. So, even knowing someone was going to confess to me, I still went. From the moment that photo was sent, I kept waiting. I waited from the afternoon until the evening. I was so happy you showed up. At that moment, I felt like I had the whole world. Dill's words tore at Susan's heart. Bill continued. I asked if you were jealous, but I didn't leave space for you to answer. Do you know why, Susan? Because I was afraid your answer wouldn't be what I wanted. I was afraid you'd disappoint me. I deceived myself, thinking that as long as you showed up, it meant you cared about me. Susan, we can stay in touch. Talk about work, life, and the child. But let's not talk about love, okay? You say you love me, but I've spent so many years trying to prove your love for me. Susan, I'm tired. Epilogue 2. Susan May 14th. Susan hasn't been sleeping well lately. Her belly is getting bigger. And her nerves are fraying. Everyone is advising her to terminate the pregnancy. But Susan refuses. She's scared. She's scared that without this child, she and Bill would have no connection at all. Just like the villa in City A. A city without Bill is suffocating. The city as she once knew was just a cold building. But Bill made it come alive. Gave it warmth. The carpets on the floor. The paintings on the walls. The vases on the tables. The stickers on the fridge. The cushions on the sofa. The decorations on the shelves. And the ginkgo tree outside. All those details she once ignored now felt like nails piercing her heart. It hurt so much. Standing on the balcony, from her current position, she could just see Bill's house. Even though she couldn't see Bill, she felt like she could breathe under the same sky. On those sleepless nights, she questioned herself countless times, why did she let her relationship with Bill come to this point? They used to be so harmonious and happy. Susan squinted her eyes slightly. She remembered their college days. She remembered when Bill confessed his love to her. That day was very ordinary. Dill was playing basketball with his classmates in the gym and insisted that Susan come to watch. Susan sat in the stands, surrounded by many other girls. But every time Bill turned his head, he always locked his eyes on Susan first. His gaze was burning, and he had a smile on his face. After the game, he went to the locker room to change. Susan intended to follow him to tell him she was leaving. But Dill suddenly put his jacket over her head and pulled her in. Susan poked her head out from under the jacket. Dill's big jacket loosely draped over her shoulders, covering her legs. Dill lowered his head, looking at her with those star-filled eyes. He said, Little girl, do you want to date? The kind that ends in marriage. Susan could still remember how she felt at that moment. Her heart raced. Her body trembled. She wanted to hug him. She wanted to kiss him. Who could refuse such bright eyes? She said, Okay. She thought she could always be protected by those eyes. But in the end, it was she who dimmed their light. Those for years and in college were the best years of her life. She and Bill lived together. The house wasn't big but it was warm. Every morning, Dill would prepare breakfast for her and give her a good morning kiss. He would smile and say, Girlfriend, stay home and wait for me to come back and support you. Every night, no matter how late, Susan would sit on the sofa waiting for him. He would always hug her, rubbing his furry, stubbly head against her shoulder, and say, Girlfriend, thank you for waiting. Dill always gave Susan all his love. But what did Susan give Bill? Neglect, indifference, and lack of response. Maybe it was because Bill was too good to her. From childhood to adulthood, she never had to ask for anything. Dill would do everything for her. He would remind Susan to study hard, urge her to sleep early and wake up early, and protect her from any harm. Once Bill muttered, 
I didn't find a girlfriend. I found an ancestor. How did she react then? She would get angry. She would be unhappy. She would speak coldly. If you don't want to do it, then don't. It's not like I asked you to. And every time, Dill would surrender. How could I not? Of course. I want to. I want to the most. Susan's heart trembled. She realized she had never given Bill any warmth. No wonder Bill didn't want her anymore. Just like Bill said, she never even smiled at him much. So, what had she been doing all these years? Epilogue 3. Susan. Susan remembered her wedding to Bill. On their wedding day, Susan was very nervous. Even more so than when she first negotiated a business deal. Because she was nervous. Her face was tense the entire time. She heard what people were saying. That they suspected the bride was being forced into marriage. Susan scoffed. Thinking these people were crazy. If Susan didn't want to get married. Who could force her? She thought Bill would be as certain as she was. But she didn't expect that he would be hurt by those words. If time could turn back. She would rush into the dressing room man into Bill's arms. She would tell everyone that this was the man she loved deeply. But there are no ifs in life. What's missed is missed. Dill gave her deep certainty, but she gave Bill doubt. She deserved it. She hadn't realized her different attitude toward Mike, and she hurt Bill because of it. She admitted she was wrong, but she didn't admit she liked Mike. However, she couldn't deny that she had wavered in her marriage because of someone else. After firing Mike, he came to see her. He questioned Susan. Why are you doing this to me? Clearly, you have feelings for me. Susan retorted. Do you think I have feelings for you? Mike nodded confidently. I can feel it. You're special to me. I know you must like me. Susan, let's be together. You're divorced now. There are no obstacles between us. We can be together properly. Susan felt an intense pain in her heart. The man who had loved her for over 20 years wasn't sure of her love. Yet a man who had been around for less than half a year dared to say such things. What had she done? To what extent had she hurt Bill? Mike, I don't like you, I didn't before, I don't now, and I won't in the future if I did anything to give you that impression. I apologize, but if you appear in front of Bill and me again, I won't be polite. Susan's tone was cold as she turned to leave, behind her. Mike's face was pale and he looked like he might collapse. He said harshly, Susan, do you think you're so great? Do you think you're blameless? If you don't like me. You shouldn't have given off signals that I could approach you. You let me get close. And now you say everything was my misunderstanding. Who do you think you are? You think you can just walk away and say you did nothing wrong. Susan felt physically and emotionally exhausted. More confused than ever. So this is who she was. So her self-assumed emotions were just this. The news of the divorce eventually reached both families. She was called back home. Her father looked at her with disappointment and shook his head. She had been her parents' pride all her life. And seeing her father look at her like that for the first time made Susan feel suffocated. She ultimately didn't keep the baby. She cried for a long time. Bill came to see her. Susan hid under the covers. She didn't dare face Bill. She hadn't kept their baby. She and Bill had no future anymore. She didn't not want the baby. She just felt she was still young and didn't want a child so early. She was too spoiled by Bill. Indulge in his affection. She felt she didn't need to consult Bill about not wanting the child. Dill would obey her unconditionally. But she was wrong. Her mother once said, If you like someone, you have to tell them. Love needs to be shown, but also spoken. No one can give endlessly without expecting something in return. Don't wait until the love is exhausted to regret. Susan had been sure that Bill's feelings for her were an exception. Now, she regretted it. Her mother said, don't do this again in the future. Susan cried and laughed. Laughed and cried. What future is there? She had been so deeply loved by Bill. How could she ever love someone else again? 